Quality public television programming is made possible in part by Success Magazine and by the annual financial contributions of viewers like you. Hello, I'm Ephraim Zimbalist, Jr. From the earliest days of our country's history, one idea has defined the spirit of our land more than any other. This idea, the American dream, has compelled countless millions to pursue it. For many, it's a symbol of hope for a brighter and more prosperous tomorrow. To those men and women who've achieved it, to those who've risen from poverty and obscurity to prominence and wealth, we as a nation have reserved our highest honors and respect. Profiles of the American Dream tells the story of two such men. They're Richard DeVos and J. Van Andel, co-founders of a unique business phenomenon known as Amway, an organization that in the span of one generation has grown from the basements of their homes into an international multi-billion dollar economic colossus. Starting with little more than an idea, a few basic products, and a fervent belief in the free enterprise system, DeVos and Van Andel revolutionized an industry and influenced millions of people around the world, living proof that the American dream is alive and well. Starting as two young veterans in a small town in uh, Michigan, Ada, uh, they really have uh, created uh, an empire that extends all around the world. You know, the sun never sets uh, on their business. I'm on record as saying a number of times that if we had a few more million people who shared their concepts, America would really have no problems. I have to say, I don't think there's an organization like Amway to command my respect and affection and esteem. I think their legacy is going to be the size and vitality of Amway itself. And that will be their legacy. Not just that they made it for themselves, but that Tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, ultimately, will have also uh, made it as a result of the company which they created. Attending high school together in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1940, the two young men had many things in common. Both were from close-knit Dutch families, both were children of the Depression, and both shared an interest in automobiles. An old Model A Ford would be responsible for bringing the two boys together. My father, Jay, uh, was a senior classman at the time, and Rich, being a couple of years younger, uh, was a junior classman. And Dad, because of my grandfather, who was in the car business, had a rarity at the time, and that was an automobile. But Rich took the initiative to approach Dad and say, I would like to offer you 25 cents a week if you would take me back and forth to school, because we both live pretty close to each other in the same neighborhood. And so they agreed to do that, and uh, they worked out a kind of a business relationship on that basis, but from that spawned a friendship over time. From this seemingly minor boyhood business deal would develop a friendship and partnership that would span decades and inspire millions. During a summer break from school in 1940, the two young men were afforded their first opportunity to earn money as partners. Jay Van Andel's father, part owner of a Grand Rapids automobile dealership, offered the boys a deal. My grandfather came to uh, my dad and said, I need a few cars delivered to uh, a customer out in Montana. 
and so he wondered if he and possibly Rich wouldn't drive these cars out there. Well, at the time, uh, Rich, I believe, was only about 15. He didn't have a driver's license. But this never stopped him from saying, yes, I'd be happy to do that. And so they set out on this fantastic journey to deliver these two cars. The only problem is, is once they got there, they had to figure out a way to get back because they had to leave the cars there, and Grandpa didn't tell them how to get back. But uh, finally, eventually figured a way out to do that. While their friendship blossomed over the next two years, any future endeavors would have to wait. In 1941, World War II came to Grand Rapids and the DeVos and Van Andel households. Before leaving for the service, the two young friends made a vow to go into some sort of business together once the war was over. Oh, it was gung-ho, man alive, we can do anything, let's get out there and get it. Opportunities here as never before, the war's behind me. Now I'm going to get into business my own and I'm really going to do things for my life. Going to get me an education, going to get married, going to have a family, going to raise my kids. I mean, it was really upbeat and gung-ho like you can't believe. victory in the war, Van Andel, two years older than DeVos, was the first to be discharged. Months later, with DeVos home on a short leave, the two renewed their friendship and began serious discussions about starting a business together once DeVos returned home. For much of America, the attitude of the day was one of optimism and hope. It was an attitude young Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel shared, wholeheartedly. It was their view coming off World War II that the entire nation was going to take wings and fly, that the airplane was really the, going to be the future. And who knew at that point? I mean, it was possible that cars would be obsolete and everybody would have a, a hangar next to their house. Uh, uh, they didn't know which way it was going, but felt that that was a growing uh, enterprise, growing business, and the excitement of flying captivated them. With DeVos's military service not yet completed, Jay Van Andel and a childhood friend by the name of James Bosher decided to hang their shingle at the local airfield and open a flight training school. Wolverine Air Service, the inaugural business venture of the three young veterans, was a modest success. While Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel thrived on the chaos created by the growing business, James Bosher, the third partner, did not. In 1948, 18 months after helping form the partnership, Bosher sold his interest to DeVos and Van Andel. The three-way partnership, now down to a duo, continued on its entrepreneurial journey. Well, as part of the Dutch tradition, the, the Dutch work ethic says idle hands are the devil's workplace, and so you, you, you've got to continue to find opportunities to work. Well, the airplane business at that time, teaching uh, airplane flying, was a daytime job. So they said, well, there's an evening opportunity here. We, we've got some, some more chance to work at night. So they had seen out in their traveling out in the West uh, the so-called drive-in restaurant, the, uh, which was a brand new idea in Grand Rapids. So they opened, I think, the first restaurant, drive-in restaurant in Grand Rapids called Riverside, uh, Riverside Drive-In Restaurant. It's a brand new concept uh, that they worked at night. So they're flying during the day and flipping burgers at night. Though this expansion was a success, the duo quickly decided the restaurant business was not to be their ticket to wealth and fame. My father uh, said that, that uh, he'd been in the restaurant business once and he never wanted to go back in it again. He said it was a lousy business because everybody got hungry at the same time and that was the problem. They couldn't control the demand. They couldn't sort of spread the spread it out. So there would be a, it was a feast and famine kind of thing, pardon the pun, where everybody would come rushing in at one time. So you'd have this big rush 
you'd never have enough capacity, and then you'd have empty seats, you know, for the rest of the, the next two or three hours, and it drove them crazy. Growing somewhat restless, DeVos and Van Andel set out to find something new. This new venture, they reasoned, would have to be challenging, adventurous, and considerably less confining than a drive-in restaurant. I think uh, by this time, the parents of both Dad and Rich had probably figured out that uh, these kids were a little adventurous. And uh, so when they came in and told them, we're going to buy a boat and we're going to sail around the world, I'm sure they probably nodded their heads and said, yeah, that's nice, okay, we'll go ahead and do that. And never really taking them serious, probably, at first, that they were actually going to do that. But being the types of individuals that they are, uh, they were dead set on doing it, and they did it. The only problem is, uh, they didn't know how to sail. They got thoroughly lost. My father says he used to... Uh, he used to lay awake all night worrying about how he was going to get the boat away from the dock in the morning, and he'd worry all day about how they were going to safely get the boat into the dock at night. They knew so little of what to do. They just cut the line and on their way. They, they apparently crushed dinghies. They, they uh, hit walls. They did a lot of amazing stuff as they gradually learned the process. In March of 1949, however, their luck was about to change. I remember it was uh, 2.30 in the morning when uh, we started to uh, take on a lot of water, and that's about that same time we sighted some lights. I remember we held up the uh, red railroad flares and gave an SOS on a flashlight, and then the Adabel lights turned and came to our rescue. Of course, that first ship went by before the Adabel lights stopped, and uh, when, that, when the second one stopped, we were mighty glad, you remember? Oh, boy. And uh, then if I remember they first tried to save our boat, tried to get the water out of it, but this proved impossible, so we had to undergo the sad experience of letting it sink and watching it go down. Then we uh, went on that boat to Puerto Rico. Yeah, and from there on, of course, we continued our adventure as we went on down through uh, South America and spent some three or four months yet covering all of South America. Without missing a beat, the two returned to Grand Rapids 12 months after beginning right on schedule. Though unaware at the time, young Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel were about to meet their future, face to face. Well, Neutralite Products back in the late 1940s was one of the first of what we call today a multi-level marketing company. Door-to-door uh, -door sales and direct selling had been around for years, uh, but Neutralite went one step further. Uh, its independent distributors not only sold the product themselves, but they went out and recruited others to also sell the product. Uh, the sponsor for helping to train and motivate uh, these new recruits would then uh, be able to have a commission on the sales that are generated by the people in his group. Now, back then, this uh, system was relatively unheard of, but uh, today we all recognize the fact that this is a very credible and legitimate form of marketing and uh, distribution. The Neutralite Company had been founded in the early 1930s by a Mr. Carl Renborg, a biochemist, who, while studying in China in the 1920s, had developed several unique theories on nutrition. Well, Carl Renberg was my father, and he started Neutralite Products in 1934, and he began to conceive of a, of a supplement or something that could be added back into the diet that would bring the diet back into balance and would help then strengthen people's nutritional status and thereby help them to prevent disease rather than, than to cure it. And so it was that in the fall of 1949, Rich DeVos and J. Van Andel, ages 23 and 25, signed on as independent distributors to sell the Neutralite line of products. The main product they were to sell was a box of food supplements called Double X, a daily vitamin tablet costing around $20 for a month's supply. Armed with sales literature, samples, and a prospect list of all their friends and family, the two enthusiastic partners set out. 
fully expecting to set the world on fire. Their first two weeks as distributors, with both working full-time at this new venture, they sold a combined total of one box. Destiny, however, was about to give the young entrepreneurs a nudge in the right direction. Neil Mascont, their sponsor, suggested they attend an upcoming sales rally in Chicago. What they saw was not a small gathering of down-on-their-luck door-to-door salesman types, but a hotel ballroom full of enthusiastic and motivated Neutralite distributors, many of whom had been active in the business for years. Impressed with this, Rich and Jay returned to Grand Rapids and made the decision to give this direct selling business a fair and square shot. Their operation was simple. During the day, they would distribute product brochures and make contact with prospects. At night, they would conduct opportunity meetings, oftentimes in the home of a new distributor. We had uh, uh, met our sponsor in Grand Rapids, and he said he would come down and put a meeting on for us in, in the Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. And he brought this young kid with him. He's single and 23 years old, and he was going to tell us how we could build a million dollar business by selling food supplements. Um, I wasn't very confident about that. Uh, and he came in, and of course he did very well. That young fellow happened to be Rich DeVos. By the early 1950s, DeVos and Van Andel, though still in their mid-twenties, had found their calling. A uniquely American form of direct sales called network, or person-to-person -person marketing. Their partnership, growing stronger by the day, had found its rhythm. Partnerships are tricky, and I don't know anyone in America, in any area, in any in enterprise, entertainment, athletics, business, politics, who has managed partnership better than Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel. Much is made of their differences, but I think the real story is in their similarities. I think beneath those very obvious differences, there are two men who are fundamentally very much, very much alike. Throughout the decade of the 1950s, the duo of Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel worked brilliantly, with strengths and talents that seemed perfectly to complement one another. They built their Neutralite distributorship into a thriving organization of some 2,000 distributors. While the DeVos Van Andel partnership was operating smoothly and efficiently, large scale problems had begun to surface at the Neutralite Products headquarters, which was actually two separate corporations. These two corporations worked together without incident for several years. But by 1958, a serious wall of conflict had arisen between Carl Renborg, the founder and manufacturer, and Meitinger and Castleberry, the leaders of the distributor organization. Throughout 1958, Jay Van Andel and Rich DeVos, by now well-known and respected by both feuding management camps, traveled to the home office in California several times, seeking to moderate between the two warring factions. But it was too late. The years of bickering and strife between the two Neutralite companies had left the organization severely damaged. Jay Van Andel's diplomacy skills, however, were noticed by Carl Renborg, the founder of Neutralite, and he offered the young and executive-minded Van Andel the opportunity to advance from the field and head up the sales organization of the entire company. For Jay Van Andel, this represented a tremendous opportunity. It also meant that his partnership with Rich DeVos would come to an end. Jay faced a serious dilemma uh, when Neutralite approached him about joining the company. And Jay determined at that time that, that his partnership and relationship with, with my father and his commitment, and their joint commitment together, uh, was more valuable and that the complementary strengths that they brought were more than a, an additive variety, that they were an exponential 
variety, so that one plus one didn't equal two. In their case, one plus one equaled you know, eight or ten or twelve. With this decision out of the way, the two partners, along with a handful of the leading Neutralite distributors they had sponsored, decided that drastic measures were needed to address the still unresolved feuding at the Neutralite headquarters. One of the leading distributors in the Divorce Van Andel organization was a young milkman from Ohio named Joe Victor. It came to the point to where uh, uh, we decided we'd get together, and it just so happened that Neutralite, uh, the Neutralite company, had a meeting in Charlevoix, Michigan. And there were several of us there, and uh, there were probably six or seven of us that uh, stayed up uh, a good part of the evening good part of the night really and talked about our future and at that time we decided well we'd do something we'd make a make a, a stand so we formed what we called the American Way Association what they didn't know was that something big was about to be born without fanfare or ceremony the two young men to whom hundreds of distributors were looking for leadership quietly and officially organized their new company in the basement of J. Van Andel's home. The name of this new company, derived from the name of the loose-knit association they had formed one year earlier, was simply to be called Amway. After we formed the American Way Association, uh, we started looking around for a product. Uh, I remember Jay and Rich come up with a car wash and it didn't really seem to have the merit, so we kind of tossed that aside. And uh, one of the uh, fellows in my area, he was an insurance uh, guy. He was a debit man. And he knew what was going on because I had sponsored him. So he came to me this one day and he said, uh, you guys are looking for a product. And I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to bring one over to you. He said, it's called Frisk. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, you keep talking about a concentrate and neutralite, and so this is a concentrate of a concentrated cleaner. We found that in Akron, Ohio, and uh, called up Jay to, uh, to say, well, I think we found a product you'd like. Uh, would you like to come down to Akron? And he said, well, he didn't think he and Rich had time. So uh, Fred and Joe Victor said, well, we'll come as far as Toledo and you meet us there and so we brought the mason jar half full of this yellow substance the enthusiastic group of Amway distributors was soon selling so much of this product they quickly outgrew the manufacturer divorce and van andel then bought out the formula and renamed the product liquid organic cleaner LOC for short DeVos and Van Andel soon added other products to the line. Some were winners, and some were not. One product that sold well from the start was a concentrated laundry detergent called SA-8. It, along with LOC, would become the first nationally marketed biodegradable cleaning products in the United States. Amway has always had a knack for being right on the front edge of, of larger issues. Uh, a case in point is the environmental issue in the 60s. Uh, just at the time that people began to be really concerned about the impact of, of uh, products and consumer goods on the environment, uh, DeVos and Van Andel came along with products like LOC and SA-8 which uh, anticipated that concern and responded to it. And uh, their timing was perfect. And in fact, I think uh, probably, if you'll uh, permit me a little uh, idealism here, I think their motives were, were right, too. I think they really were concerned about the environment, and they believed that that would sell, that, that the customer would pay uh, for that concern. Because most of the independent distributors who sold the product line had never seen the company headquarters in Michigan, DeVos and Van Andel created a traveling promotion that would take the company directly to the distributors. 
As the Amway Showcase bus traveled the country, DeVos and Van Andel's enthusiastic distributor force began to spread its dual message of free enterprise and patriotism. And Middle America seemed ready to listen. The period of the mid-60s to the, to the end of the 60s was a period of alienation and discontent. It was during Vietnam. It was during the time or immediately after the time of the, the Kennedy assassinations, the King assassination. Uh, we're talking Kent State, Jackson State, Vietnam. It was a time of, of uh, sharp confrontation, of sharply drawn differences. And, and many people were very depressed about our country and very uh, they're not very hopeful about the future of our country. Our country seemed to be pulling apart uh, and the positive tone, the positive message, more than the nationalistic message, made uh, the DeVos Van Andel uh, form of Americanism uh, so powerful. At first glance, this direct selling concept seemed an unlikely candidate for success. After all, why would hard-working men and women, many with good-paying jobs and all the trappings of a comfortable middle-class lifestyle, work part-time in a sideline business selling soap products? But DeVos and Van Andel knew that many Americans were hungry for an opportunity to own their own business. And for many, this would be their best opportunity. 1964 was also the year that Rich DeVos recorded a landmark speech. Fellow achievers and fellow Americans, Canadian friends from the North, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Rich is one of the thought. greatest speakers in America. I have never, ever in my whole life heard anybody deliver messages as well as Rich DeVos can deliver them. When he did Selling America, and I heard it, I was impressed with it. it. To me, it was the heartbeat of America. It still is. Then Congressman Gerald Ford was so moved by DeVos's Selling America that he read the entire speech into the 1965 U.S. Congressional Record. As the 1960s drew to a close, America was beginning to take notice of Rich DeVos, J. Van Andel, and their soap company from Michigan. By 1970, just 11 years after the humble beginnings from their basements, DeVos and Van Andel's Amway had surpassed $100 million in annual sales. Because of the phenomenal growth and the efforts of its vocal and now 100,000 strong distributor force, Amway had begun to attract widespread attention. However, not all of the attention was good. In the 60s and 70s, we had an educational job to do. Uh, a lot of people did not have a good opinion of uh, direct selling in any type, whether it was car salesman, whether it was insurance salesman, or whether it was multi-level, or whether it was Amway. Well, because mostly it was a communications gap, that's number one. Their perception was if you listen to it and don't really understand it, it has the earmarks of a pyramid or it has the earmarks of a get-rich-quick scheme, and a lot of people are just inherently skeptical of that. Fueling the controversy were several less-than-honest companies that had sprung up in the 1960s and 1970s. Right around that time, uh, there seemed to be this, the subject of the day was the so-called pyramid idea, and... Uh, uh, there was a guy named Glenn Turner and a couple of other people that had made the headlines uh, of selling garage fulls of things to people and paying big fees to see if you could find another guy to buy a garage full. And, and so there were a lot of newspaper articles about that kind of stuff. Well, those weren't businesses. 
uh, in my opinion, those were just schemes, and there are always schemes in this world for people that want to make money without working. Although DeVos and Van Andel succeeded in distinguishing Amway from these fraudulent operations, it wasn't long before the company's public image took another blow. National headlines in the spring of 1975 announced that the Federal Trade Commission had begun to scrutinize Amway's practices. In May of 1979, after nearly five years of investigations, the FTC closed the matter and released its opinion. It's interesting. I think it was somewhere around 1980 when the uh, FTC investigation was finally completed. And yet in around 75, I don't think Amway was doing more than three or four hundred million dollars worth of sales worldwide. And by the conclusion of the investigation, five years later, with uh, nonstop headlines about Amway's investigation, you know, as a illegal this and illegal that, uh, our sales reached a billion dollars for the first time in our history, the same year that the FTC uh, basically said that we were indeed a, a, not only legitimate, but a, a, a very remarkable business opportunity. By the end of the 1970s, DeVos and Van Andel's vision, by now a bona fide movement, had begun to spread around the world. I've interviewed Amway people and been in Amway meetings literally around the world. I have been in Thailand and watched uh, people by the thousands uh, sit on the ground in a soccer stadium to hear the opportunity explained to them. Uh, I've been in, in Italy and, and uh, Germany and many, many countries around the world and it does not seem the least bit American, nor is it American to them. Uh, th there's a kind of universality about the Amway appeal that lies very close to the heart of the human experience. It really responds to the desire of men and women in all cultures to see themselves in control of their own futures. In 1959, as DeVos and Van Andel formulated the concept for their new company, nearly everything about it was decidedly American. What Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel would soon discover, however, was that certain fundamental desires transcend national borders. I think the idea of Amway works all over the world because people are basically the same all over the world. And when you bring a person who's never had their own business, an opportunity like this, where there's like a little business in a box, and their dreams start coming alive again, I don't think it matters what country they're in, what language they speak, uh, the same principles seem to work, the same dreams exist, the same fears exist, and, and uh, borders don't seem to make any difference. I don't believe that history will remember them simply as two men who started with nothing and became fabulously wealthy, although that's obviously true. But many men have done that. I think their legacy is going to be the size and vitality of Amway itself. And that will be their legacy. Not just that they made it for themselves, but that tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people ultimately, will have also uh, made it as a result of the company which they created. By the time Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel stepped back from active management of the company in the early 1990s, they were listed among the wealthiest men in the world. 
The fledgling Amway Corporation, started in the basements of their homes in 1959, had grown into an international multi-billion dollar economic empire and one of the world's largest direct selling companies. DeVos and Van Andel's belief in the free enterprise system and their offer of opportunity was now shared by an enthusiastic army of several million independent Amway distributors in some 60 countries and territories around the world. These two young veterans who returned from World War II with little more than a dream of owning their own business, surely not even they could have imagined what they would set in motion with the sale of that first small box of Neutralite so many years ago. For Profiles of the American Dream, I'm Ephraim Zimbalist, Jr. Select reader, sharing in the wisdom and secrets of some of the wealthiest and most creative entrepreneurial minds. From early innovators to emerging tycoons, then as now, success delivers the latest trends, winning strategies, and bold ideas, helping you to uncover the winner within. Each month, success empowers you with winning techniques direct from the front lines, providing you with innovative solutions and ideas designed to light up profits. From boardrooms to bottom lines, you'll share lessons from legends, helping you turn your dreams into virtual reality. Whether you set your sights globally or on your own backyard, success helps you keep your competitive edge sharpened. For over 100 years, success has celebrated the entrepreneurial mindset. If you fit the picture, invest in yourself. Call 1-800-234-7324 and subscribe today. Or pick up a copy at your newsstand and see for yourself. Success, the magazine for today's entrepreneurial mind.